So good day everyone, uh, so my name is Turin Dillaby and I'm indeed from uh, KU Leuven. Uh, at KU Leuven we are working on an ADCS, which will be incorporated in the Simba mission for the QB50 uh, mission. So I'll talk about the uh, Star Tracker, and as we all know, as CubeSat missions complexity rises, so we are able to do more and more with these uh, satellites, the demands on the attitude determination and control system also rise. So for example, if you think about Earth observation, uh, astronomical mission, or even formation flying, we need accurate control and, and agile um, control and uh, accurate determination. So to achieve this high accuracy determination, so that's the part I will be focusing on, um, the star tracker is often required. The downside is that it's, it's pretty expensive and um, it's, it's hard to develop. Um, so I'll talk about two star tracker cost reductions, so two ways in which we um, try to reduce the cost. And that's one to reduce the component cost, and two, to reduce uh, the design and testing cost. So to reduce component cost, what, are, uh, what we are trying to do is to uh, use more robust and less computationally complex algorithms so that um, we can use less expensive processors so that we can have the same uh, performance with um, less uh, expensive components. And we are trying to reduce the design and testing cost by using a more standardized and fast procedure which I will introduce um, at the end of the presentation. So if you look at the star tracker, um, basically what it does, it takes an image of the stars, it tries to determine the star center as, as accurately as possible, and after that in the star identification um, step, it tries to identify which stars are in the image. Um, when, when you know what the camera stars are, what the database image stars are, then you can determine the attitude you can track it out with. Um, so what we are trying to do is to reduce computational cost. So um, we reduce the cost of the centroiding algorithm and of the tracking algorithm, and the robustness of the star identification and the tracking algorithm will go up. So I will introduce briefly the three algorithms that we developed at KU Leuven. Um, I will go over them quite quickly because we don't have that much time, but you can look up more information or contact me if you have questions about any of them um, after the presentation. So if you look at centroid in, we try to determine the star centroids as accurately as possible. So we see a signal of a defocused star here, so it's brightest, brightest in the middle and then it falls off towards the edges. And you can quite accurately model that by a Gaussian function. So we have two ways to determine the centroids, two classical ways in which it is done. So you can have a center of gravity method, which is quite fast because it's a very easy calculation. But it has lower accuracy. On the other hand, you can fit the Gaussian function through it, take the centroid at the center of the Gaussian, and you will have higher accuracy. So at KU Leuven, we developed an algorithm um, which is called the Gaussian grid algorithm, which combines that low computational uh, complexity with higher accuracy. Now, the way in which we do that is to use a function fitting method. So we will indeed plot a Gaussian through it, but we will do it in an analytical way. So normally, how it is done now is you uh, use the least squares iterative approach to fit the function through it, but we will try to find analytical closed form solutions to fit uh, the function. Now to find an analytical solution for a problem, you, you cannot find it for every problem, um, so we will simplify the, uh, the equations that we need. But the first thing we do is we simplify the function to fit, so that's a 2D Gaussian you see there by first removing the uh, exponentials, so we take the, the log of that function. And also because we know that our uh, measurements are taken on an equally spaced grid, because they are uh, measured by pixels um, on the camera, we can express the coordinates relatively towards uh, a center coordinate. Now if we do that, we can find an analytical solution, and the good thing is that the equations that come out of this are pretty simple. So we get similar accuracy, because basically we solve the same problem. Um, but it's a lot faster than the fastest accurate method, so in, in the calculations we did, it was 40 times faster, which is uh, a considerable uh, reduction in computational cost. The second algorithm I will look at, so I, as I said, I, I will only cover it briefly, um, is the lost in space algorithm. So at the beginning of every um, uh, mission, you need to find your first attitude, and you can be looking at every star in the catalog. 
So we will have the lost in space problem, which will go through the entire star database to find our current attitude. Now the most important thing here is robustness. So we need to be sure that we get the right attitude the first time, or otherwise we cannot start de uh, determining the attitude. Now there are a lot of algorithms to determine this. Um, there's actually a new one hanging uh, on a poster at the door right there. Um, so there are a lot of ways to do this. The way in which we do it is to use the shortest distance transform algorithm, which basically takes the star image and turns it into a distance map. So on the left you see Orion, on the right um, you see the distance map on that. And uh, a distance map is something that um, holds in every position the distance towards the closest star. Then we can uh, determine, uh, then we can build images out of the database, put them on this distance map, and uh, based on that, determine how closely the two images resemble each other, and that way we can determine the initial attitude. Um, the advantage of that is um, we have three graphs here. So what these graphs show is how often, so how much percentage of the time, we determine the attitude correctly. So we start at 100% if there's no distortion. So on the top left graph, you see that even if there are distortions up to um, 1,000 arc seconds, um, we still determine around 100% of the attitude correctly. So that's already a big distortion that we are able to cover. If there are a lot of false stars, that's the graph on the top right, so even up to 400 false stars, so for example, noise we can take in that we see in stars, even if there are 400 of those, um, we still determine the accurate, uh, the accurate alt uh, attitude 100% of the time. And also, if there are bright stars missing in the image, we are very robust to that. A second thing is that this algorithm also um, very clearly signals whether it was um, a right determination or a wrong determination. So on the x-axis here, we have the percentage of closed stars and the uh, black graph shows the correct determinations and the orange one shows the wrong determinations. So we see that it is correct that we have a very high score in percentage of closed stars. If it is wrong, we have a very low score, so we can clearly separate them and have a very robust um, decision criterion. So that, um, that's how we uh, increase the robustness of the star identification algorithm. If you then look at the tracking algorithm, uh, the traditional approach, so the tracking algorithm gets as an input um, the positions of the stars in the camera image, so in the bottom frame of the satellite, and the positions of the stars in the inertial image, uh, in the inertial frame, so the database stars. What you try to do then is solve what is called Wabba's problem here. So you have, um, you try to find the rotation matrix A that minimizes the loss function given here. So we are trying to rotate database image stars on top of the camera stars as uh, good as possible, so to minimize the distance between those rotated stars. And then we have uh, the correct rotation matrix A, which can then be converted into a quaternion, of course. What we have developed is called the AIM algorithm, which is basically the 2D equivalent of the Wabba problem. So we will not use unit vectors, we will use the focal plane coordinates of the star images. So we will try to find the rotation and the two translations that map the database stars on the camera stars. So we will also um, develop a cost function which minimizes that distance with more or less solving the same problem, but then in, in 2D. Now the advantage of that is that um, if you solve that problem um, in 2D, that you are slightly faster. The difference isn't that big, but it's, it's already a little bit faster than the current fastest algorithms. And on the other hand, in some cases, you can also reduce the computational cost further by reusing previous data. So you can reuse the same database image for a couple of times if your attitude doesn't change that much. And that way you can um, limit um, certain calculations, which you cannot limit in um, the traditional approach, and that saves a considerable amount of time. So the low, lower computational cost is again given by this algorithm. Um, the second thing is that it's, uh, it has also a, rel a reliable performance criterion. So again, we are getting a very good idea of whether our attitude was determined correctly or not. And more importantly, we can very efficiently remove inaccurate data. 
So often you will have the case that if you track, for example, nine stars, that eight of them are quite well, but one of them is, for example, an outlier. Uh, maybe it's a false star, maybe it's a star that wasn't determined that well by um, the centroiding algorithm. And in the traditional approach, you would lose your entire attitude determination from, for that step. Um, what we can do is we can easily single out that star, we can find which star is the outlier, simply remove it, recalculate the attitude in a very efficient way. So that clearly um, increases the robustness of the tracking algorithm quite a lot. So by doing this, we can um, lower the computational cost, increase the robustness, and in that way, you can either have improved performance with the same components, or try to use lower cost components, um, try to allow for, for um, lower quality components and still have the same um, performance. Now to reduce testing um, and design costs, um, th this is actually um, a quite big uh, thing that we use in, in our design. So um, it's based on the PhD thesis of Yuri Nordenstein, who is based on observation and estimation for space applications. So the problem in, in designing a star tracker is that everything influences each other. If you take, for example, a bigger field of view, you will see more stars, you will be able to track more stars, which improves your accuracy. But on the other hand, a bigger field of view has other effects which limit the accuracy. So it's very hard to, to get a good feeling of, of what design changes do to um, your performance. So what we have here is, is like a great tool in, in which you can just give your input for your star tracker, you can give your camera performance um, um, values, and it very easily tells you what the uh, implications are on your performance, on speed, on the accuracy, etc. Uh, the good thing is also um, this tool is um, based on the ECSS standards, so all the values you, you get out of it are according to ECSS standards, so that also makes it easier to compare it to other star trackers um, to get a better idea of, of what you should use. Um, so it's, it's handy to use in a design environment. It's also very good to um, validate your star tracker performance against during testing. You can very easily see um, which values are off and what you can change to improve that. So what I basically tried to show you today is that we have developed new algorithms um, which have some um, implications that can uh, improve the performance or reduce the cost. And that we also have a very handy tool. Um, so this is not the only tool we use. We also have um, a similar um, design tool for the entire ABCS system. So you can, if you want to learn more about that, you can read the PhD thesis or ask me questions about that. Um, and also this again uh, makes it easier and faster to test and develop the start rate. So that's what I wanted to show you today, uh, today. so thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have uh, questions from the audience? Uh, so it seems that it's very computationally impressive, and that's, uh, that's one of the first problems. Is uh, did anybody looking at kind of analog ways to do some pre-processing on the hardware level and then do digital processing? Sometimes this helps a lot in uh, speeding up the computer, the final computation. So if there is any analog, you know, uh, front end of the camera where you can do some piece embroidery. Uh, in start writers, I don't know if people use it. Okay, so so what you can do is um, before you send. Um, your data to the processor, you, you, uh, what can be done is to do the centroiding on an FPGA, for example. So that is something that, that can be done uh, in the pre-processing step, if that's what you mean. Okay. Any other questions? So if there is no questions, I have one. So oh, the, the oh, there one is, okay, yeah. yes. Um, hi, thanks for the, for the talk. Um, uh, two questions. Um, the, the one is, um, what's the size of the star database that you use? How many stars? And so we use the, the Hipparchos database um, and we um, filter them up to a magnitude of, of six. Um, to tell you how many stars it is, it's around 1,000 to 1,500, I think. But I can give you ten. Okay. Um, and the other question is, do you have an indication of how long your lasting space algorithm takes? Um, 
I have some data on that, then that but that's calculated on, on the, just a PC. There it's in, in the order of, of milliseconds. Um, on the processor, uh, I can give you data about that, but it's, it's pretty fast. What we do is we, um, we have around a thousand database images, which we compare to um, the camera image, to the distance transform map, and, and it's, it's pretty fast. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. So,